Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Becky Robinson, and I am so thrilled to be here today with Hesha Abrams as we talk about her new book, Holding the Calm, which is coming from Barrett Kohler Publishers in just one month. And we're so pleased that you've joined us today. So as you're coming into the webinar event, I hope that you'll take a moment in the chat to let us know where you're calling in from, either your geographical location or the, uh, the organization with which you're associated. We would love to give you a shout out and welcome you here. And we're gonna give folks a few minutes as people are still continuing to log on. Uh, we're so glad to see you today. So welcome in Stockholm, Sweden, in Columbus, Ohio, in Malaysia, in Durham, North Carolina, Chicago, Birmingham, Alabama. These are so fast. I don't know that I can read them so fast. I see some <laughs> Canadian callers. I see someone in Nova Scotia. Um, amazing. So thank you for taking a moment to say hello. We have an independent OD consultant in Cleveland, Ohio, Vancouver, Washington, Brazil, uh, someone else in Canada, in Ontario. Um, amazing. And we're so thrilled that you've chosen to join with us today and invest an hour of your time learning with Hesha Abrams. I know that you will not regret it. So I want to give you a heads up about a few technical considerations for today's call. We are recording the call. We will make this uh, recording available to you later in case you'd like to share it with a friend or colleague. Also, Hesha does have a few slides today, and we will make those slides available to you as a PDF after the event for your additional learning. Um, so please feel free throughout today's event to use the chat. We encourage you to use the drop down menu to select everyone so that everyone can see your comments. And go ahead and pop any questions or comments that you have in the chat throughout the event. And later on in today's call, we will have some time to take your Q&A. So again, welcome. We're so thrilled that you've joined us. Uh, before we get any further, I do want to take a moment to introduce you to Hesha Abrams. She is an internationally acclaimed master attorney mediator, and she is known for crafting highly creative settlements and resolutions in very difficult matters. Holding the Calm is her new book. As I mentioned, it's coming from Barrett Kohler Publishers. It will be launching in uh, July of this year on the 26th. It is now available for pre-order. We'll be sharing those links throughout the event as well. Holding the Calm is Hesha's insightful, practical, and easy to use toolkits forged in the trenches of resolving human conflict. It is her contribution to help make our world, our businesses, and our relationships a little bit more harmonious. So if you are hoping to create more harmony in your family, in your life, in your organization, you are in the right place because Hesha is going to teach us today how to hold the calm and why it matters. So Hesha, welcome. Hi. Hi, everybody. So glad to have you all with us. So Hesha, as we get started today, um, you know, this, this idea that our world needs uh, more calm, that we need more civilized discussion for the divisiveness that has seemed to taken over, this should not be surprising to anyone on the call. And I'm curious, given your 30 years of experience in managing, resolving conflict and mediating conflict, um, I know that you found what works somehow. And you've worked on a recent dispute for the secret, well, I guess it wasn't recent. You, you worked on this dispute with the secret recipe for Pepsi. And you've dealt with multiple billion dollar business cases where people were really hurt. So I'm wondering as we get started, can you give us some insights about how holding the calm worked in those huge and you know expensive situations? So I'll share with you human beings, and when we get to the slides, I'm gonna share with you a little bit about how the brain works and how the amygdala works. What's so interesting is two roommates arguing over whose cat peed on the rug is almost exactly the same as a multi-billion dollar dispute for Amazon or Google or IBM, or the secret recipe for Pepsi that I did, because it's all human beings. And how we interact with each other when something's important and dear to us, it's important and dear to us. And we either fight about it, we run away, we freeze, we argue, we handle things in a habituated way, generally the way you were taught as a kid. And if you have some skill set development, okay, maybe you added a little bit more to that. And what usually happens is that whenever you get into conflict, all conflict starts with tension, all of it starts with tension. And so if it's not resolved, I like to use the analogy of spaghetti sauce on the counter. If you drip spaghetti sauce on the counter and you wipe it right up with a sponge, Rock and roll comes right up, right? What if you leave it overnight? You're scraping it off with a spatula. Use that analogy for all conflict. When things are tense and when they're difficult, 
we don't want to deal with them. It's annoying. Maybe it'll go away. Maybe it'll stop. I don't know how to handle this. This is too difficult. It just gets worse and worse. And the worst part about conflict is that you feel powerless. Someone is trying to do something to me. I am trying to do something to someone else. I'm not getting my own way. This is not happening. You're not understanding me. Why aren't you understanding me? Why are you doing something so stupid and ridiculous? Boom, 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 boom. And that's how it goes. Whether you're dealing with a billion dollar case, a fight with your spouse or your kid or your boss or your neighbor or your colleague, all of that. And so I'll end that last part of that question with really an interesting piece that we're doing in you know, corporate America has really taken the lead on trying to make our society better. I mean, it really has. We do leadership training. We do uh, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion training. We do customer service training. We do so much. And that is all marvelous and good. But what is the one thing that can unravel it all? Conflict. We don't know how to handle it. And what I wanted to do with 30 years of doing this, I've done you know 10,000 matters already. I know what works. I had this amazing laboratory. And that's what I wrote in Holding the Calm is 20 tools in 20 chapters, each chapter with stories and inspiration and anecdotes about why to use it and how to use it. And I'll talk about big fancy cases and small cases, because even in big fancy cases, people still put their pants on one leg at a time and want to be right or want to not lose or want to come out of it okay, or don't want to be taken advantage of. That's what underlies all conflict. Amazing. So let's talk a little bit more about the role of our brains. And specifically, you mentioned the amygdala. Why is understanding how the brain reacts in conflict so important to holding the calm? So if everybody will indulge me, I think we had what, almost 1,100 people sign up for this webinar. So I'm very grateful to all of you for wanting to do this. If you'll indulge me, and I promise no death by PowerPoint, I've got six slides, that's it. Uh, may I share my screen with you? And let's take a peek. So holding the calm. What is holding the calm? So some of you know what the amygdala is. For those of you that don't, it's two kidney-shaped little things way in the back of your brain, right on top of the brainstem. It's often called the reptilian brain or the primitive brain. It developed first in our evolution way before the prefrontal cortex, which is right here behind the, uh, behind the uh, forehead. And what happens is that when we argue with somebody, we're arguing from here logic, reason, rationale. Let me tell you why you're wrong. Let me give you data. Let me give you facts. It doesn't persuade anybody of anything. It does not actually work, which is so interesting. So what happens is the amygdala gets triggered and the amygdala in a nanosecond will look at something and say, you're a rope, you're a stick, you're food. And immediately it's going to make that decision. Friend or foe, I like you. I don't like you. I can trust you. I don't trust you. Then we look for confirming evidence to support that hypothesis that our amygdala literally made boom right away. That happens in conflict also, which is why that spaghetti sauce analogy is so good. The quicker you can wipe something up, the easier it is. The longer you let it go on or the longer it does go on, the nastier and moldier and grosser it actually gets. Doesn't mean it can't get resolved. It can. It's just harder. So getting stuff done quickly is what happens with this amygdala. So because of that, what is the worst thing you can say to somebody who's upset? The absolute worst thing, calm down. It's terrible. And yet everybody does that. It's the absolute number one worst thing you can do. And you know why? Because the amygdala is triggered. It goes into fight, flight, or freeze. And it's all this intensity, oh my God, like this. And when you say, calm down, calm down, what you're saying to somebody is, you're powerless. You don't know what you're doing. I am going to tell you what to do. And all that makes the amygdala just fire even faster and even higher, right? So telling them to calm down is the worst thing in the world. And I like to joke that never in the history of calming down has anyone ever calmed down by being told to calm down. So the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposing views in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. 
F. Scott Fitzgerald, that's a beautiful goal to try to live for. And we can't do it very easily. But the more you strive for that, the more capacity you have. So what's the calm? Imagine any of these beautiful little scenes we have here. It's a place where you feel valued, safe, understood, heard. No matter how wrong you are, no matter how out of control you are, no matter how emotionally volatile you are, when that amygdala is triggered, all you want is that sense of, I am heard, I am listened to, I am valued, I am not powerless. So what's the holding? It's creating and sustaining the space for the calm. Now, it's so easy, literally, it's so easy. And I'm gonna invite you to try this because my guess is during the next week, someone's gonna aggravate you. Whether it's a call center, a partner, a kid, a boss, a colleague, a news story, a politician, someone's gonna aggravate you. Try saying, I'm holding the calm, I'm holding the calm, I'm holding the calm, I'm holding the calm, I'm holding the calm. What that does is it takes your amygdala from a place of being powerless to having some power. So it calms it the heck down. Now there's a moat created between the intensity of the feeling that like grips your chest into this space. Okay, I've got choices. I got options. That's the place where you can actually see those choices and those options. And one of the things I wrote in the book to try to make this accessible for people is 20 tools. Each chapter, like I said, has a tool. And if you use one, it doesn't work, use the next one. It will work. So what's not holding the calm? Defensiveness, panic, overreaction, dismissiveness, arguing. And yet I'm going to say, give yourself some grace and don't berate yourself because we all do all of these things. Just depends on the trigger. How bad is the trigger? How powerless do you feel? It is natural to do that. Now it's not effective, it's not helpful, it's not beneficial, but it is natural. That's why you learn how to hold the calm and that you have other tools available to you so you don't have to descend down into this kind of hell. So this is my last little story, reading classes. When I wrote this book, I really thought, because if those of you who don't know, writing a book is a tremendous amount of work. And it's not the book. The book I peeled out in six weeks, that was easy. It was finding a publisher, getting it published, doing the marketing, trying to explain to people what it's about and how to help. It's a tremendous amount of work. And my friends and family said, why, why are you doing this? You know, you know why, why are you doing this? And I said, because I got three decades in the trenches of human interactions. I have a laboratory. I made stuff up. I tried two new techniques. I invented things. What worked? What didn't work? So what I want this book to be is reading glasses for you. Until you get a pair of reading glasses, you don't know how bad it was or how much better it could be until you put on those reading glasses. And so I'm going to tell you something I've done that I invite you to do it when you do your travels in the world. When I travel, I like to go to cool and different indigenous places, you know, before McDonald's and Starbucks have descended on the villages. And I used to go and bring art supplies and books and things like that to just give out to people. And then I landed on something amazing. I go and I buy reading glasses, you know, the small kind that fit in tubes. You can get them for two or three bucks wholesale. And I buy a couple hundred of them. You can stuff them in your luggage because they're so small. And then it makes room for treasures that you want to acquire on your trip. And I would just pass them out to people. I would have people cry. I would have children come and grab me and drag me to their grandmother's stall so that she too could get to see. I had one old guy that had a, a 2.5 sticker and I tried to take his sticker off. And it was no, 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 no. It was like, it was a Gucci label and he wanted to keep the sticker on there. It was like, okay, it's amazing what those options and choices are. So that's what holding the calm is. It's a pair of reading glasses. How much better can it be? How much better can you avoid conflict? Can you deal with it when it happens? Can you diffuse tension? How can you make your life easier? How can we make our world, our family, our workplaces, our society less acrimonious 
and more harmonious. We can do it. We can really do it. And it's not hard. So anyway, that's, that's a little bit of my spiel on my, on my uh, little short PowerPoint. So I promise no death by PowerPoint. <laughs> I love it. So Hesha, can we talk a little bit more about how holding the calm can make societies, businesses, and families better? Well, yes. So let's say, just let's give a, a, a gross and a difficult and hard example. Um, we have had so many school shootings and concert shootings and workplace shootings and all these terrible things. Well, uh, in one of the chapters in my book, I have something about going postal. You all remember that, you know, in the 90s, it became actually like an obnoxious expression, going postal, because somebody would go into a post office and shoot it up. It was absolutely horrific. Well, there's this one woman named Cindy Halberlin, who has now become a very good friend of mine, who thought, who worked at the Postal Service. And this was way back when mediation, I mean, she and I have been in mediation so long ago that everyone thought it was some weird little touchy feely thing that would never really work until real business people, and I was a business lawyer, came in and said, no, 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 business people and complex things are just human beings that have feelings and have, don't have outlets for their anger, their rage, their disappointment, their frustration, their ego, their amygdala, you know, it was like, like little, you know, fangs that come out, it's so intense. And so the Postal Service adopted this entire uh, mediation program. And the goal of it was not commercial mediation, which is to get to a settlement or resolution. The goal was called transformative mediation, just to listen to people, just to hear each other out. Now, when this happened, you know, 30 years ago, I was a young mediator, and I will be honest, I thought, that's ridiculous. How is this going to achieve anything? There's no outcome. There's no goal. You don't try to get something signed. What, what, are, you, what are you talking about? There's like, there's no value to this. Heck, was I proven wrong big time. Ever since that uh, program went through, not a single U.S. post office has somebody go inside and go crazy and shoot it up. Not one, not one. So if we could take that model and replicate that through our society, we need an off-gassing valve. That's what we need. Now, sometimes you can settle something and sometimes you have to agree to disagree and then resolve our conflicts civilized. We have lawyers, we have courts, we have mediators, we have ombuds, we have all kinds of programs and ways to actually try to resolve disputes. But what we don't have is an off-gassing valve because people are hurting. We've got really all kinds of, you know, mental health issues and poverty issues and pain and trauma, so much. And where are these human beings? They're just bouncing around in a, in a, in a bumper car type situation, whacking into each other. Well, of course, there's going to be tremendous explosions. You know, and arming teachers is not the answer on how to do that. We're just going to have accidental shootings in schools and kids and teachers when you do that. So how do we find solutions that actually create off-gassings? Uh, there's organizations out there doing amazing things in mental health, in schools, trying to actually create this type of off-gassing. And that's really one of the reasons I also wrote this book is that if you like it and think it's good, See if you can't, Yeah, you know, well, there's all kinds of volume discounts to where it's super inexpensive. And that's why, look it. I made it a simple little paperback, easy two hour read because I wanted it inexpensive and accessible so that it can get dispersed. And you never know, you off gas somebody and they didn't shoot the place up. How would you ever know? You just have to run with a sense of, of confidence that in your little sphere of influence, each human being, we have a sphere of influence. You do what you can in your sphere of influence. And if we all do that, we're all like cells, healthy, bouncing around each other. We can really make this world better. We really, really can. And I, I'm doing my part. Honestly, I invite y'all to do your part too. And it doesn't have to be big and huge. You have to create a program or get a learning certificate or get a PhD. Your circle of influence, that's it. That's all you gotta do.
Uh, so, Hesha, let's talk about that at a micro level. So what do we do if we're talking about influencing the people around us? So what if we're in a conflict situation, someone's crying or they're withdrawing or they're sque screaming at you or they're swearing at you? Um, yeah. What do we do? And uh, can you share more about how you train people uh, to respond in those high stress situations? That's an excellent question, Becky. So I have a chapter on something I created called Vux, which I wish I could, you know, make it a better name, but it's a funny name, Vux. Validate, understand, clarify, summarize. Four little steps. Validate, understand, clarify, summarize. So what's the first thing we do? Someone's upset and their upsetness can be expressed as running away, crying, yelling, raging, you know, fomenting, however that is getting expressed is what, how that person is doing it, right? And what do we usually do? Calm down, calm down, which we've already explained is the worst thing you could possibly do, right? So never do that. You want a phenomenal little trick? Validation is the elixir. It's the magic syrup of every single thing. And you know how you validate them? Because sometimes you don't want to validate them. You're scaring me, or I disagree with you, or I think you're an idiot because my amygdala is triggered, right? You validate by naming the emotion. It's the first thing you do. So someone presents with whatever they present. You just say, wow, you seem really upset by that. You seem angry. You seem frustrated. You seem very hurt. And let's say I say to somebody, wow, you seem very angry. I'm not angry. Okay, what are you feeling? I'm really frustrated. Okay, tell me more. That will decrease it. 50%, just that. Then if you can manage to get a couple more sentences out where the person can off gas, say whatever it is that they need to say, a lot of times they can hear themselves speaking and go, that's ridiculous. That's not what I mean. That's not what I think. I'm just pissed. I'm just hurt. I'm just sad. I'm just whatever is what comes out. But because you just listen and you ask those questions, what you do for the amygdala is, I feel seen, I feel heard, I am a valuable human being with all my flaws and all my I'm valuable, right? That's all. So the amygdala can calm the heck down. Now, that's the validate. Then the you is the understand. Then the clarify is you ask a couple of questions. You don't argue with them. Well, that's ridiculous and that's stupid. And how could you think like that? Okay, pour gasoline on the fire, right? You ask questions. Why is that important to you? How would that work? What are the consequences of that? How would we pay for that? What other things would we have to give up to make that happen? How would other people feel about that? Those are just easy questions. And in the book, I have like tons and tons of sentence stems if you wanted to memorize them. But it's just kind of easy to do. And at the end is the S for summarize. Okay, so what we're gonna consider doing is to do, to do, to do. We're gonna think about to do, to do, to do. Now the person has gone into a problem solving, hearing, validating, connecting with you, right? And this is not kumbaya. I mean, I wrote this holding the calm because I am not, those of you who know me, I am not a kumbaya person, right? I don't go in and say, you know, your brain is so open, your mind is so open that your brain falls out, right? We live in a jungle. There are predators. There are difficult people. There are sociopaths. There are egotistical narcissists that we have to deal with. There are people with really poor skill sets who just know how to and just demand on you, right? So we're not kumbaya about this, but it's how much better can you do within your sphere of influence with what is available to you? you, it's magical. You will be shocked, shocked at the influence you can have, really. Well, so Hesha, you referenced really, really difficult people. And so I'm curious, can holding the calm work really, even with people who are acting like total jerks when they're off the rails? Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> because when people are acting like total jerks, what's, what's activated? Amygdala, right? And low skill set development right? Now, everybody, I mean, me included, I, I mean, I'm a human being too. You poke me hard enough. I'm going to, my amygdala is going to say, hello, hello, hello. And then I say, I'm holding the calm. I'm holding the calm. I'm holding the calm. I'm holding the calm. Okay. 
I got choices here. I've got options. So with even people that are challenging, they, they need you more. They actually need you more and you have a better service that you can do. But what I would say, some of us are, you know, super achievers. You go for the big hard stuff. A lot of us go, yeah, that sounds scary. So you know what? I have a whole chapter that I call small winnable victories. Small, little small things. Practice it on some way the unimportant. Practice it when you're returning something at Target. You know, practice it with somebody at work that's just not that critical in your life so that it doesn't matter if it succeeds or fails. You just practice it. And then when it starts to work, success begets success. Oh, okay. Now try it on someone in your family. And you know what works really great on everyone? Teenagers. <laughs> I have a few of those. It works great with teenagers. <laughs> Well, I want to go back because you, you sort of skipped over explaining how you do the understand part. So could you explain a little bit more? I get the validate part and I get the clarify and the summarize, but I, I'm still fuzzy on what understand looks like. So that's actually a good question too, because understand you correctly intuited, intuited is the hardest one. Because if my amygdala is not triggered, it's really easy for me to understand you, right? That's not hard. If my amygdala is triggered, I don't want to understand you because you're a jerk and you're an idiot and you're, you're trying to prevent me from doing something or make me do something. And I'm frustrated and I'm angry and I'm upset, right? Small winnable victories. I'm holding the calm. I'm holding the calm. And I ask questions because if I make statements, my amygdala will trigger me, right? So I ask questions. And as you say to yourself, all I have to do for understand is ask questions. So whatever questions come to you, you ask. And then as the person starts talking, you go, oh, okay. And can I give you a short little example? Yes, please. It's, um, it's used like in uh, paradigm shifting. For those of you who've done this kind of work, you know, we call it paradigm shifting. You have a certain view, but if you can change that view, it just changes the entire optical situation you're in. So imagine you're on, uh, uh, you're someplace. And there's a guy and three kids and his three kids are running around like wild animals. They're grabbing, they're swinging, they're grabbing, they're going up to people in the waiting room and whacking your newspaper. And I guess the days when we still read newspapers, you know, I mean, they're just, just, just un, undisciplined all over the place. Well, everybody else in that waiting room had a certain paradigm and everybody would look at each other and think, oh my God, what is wrong with this guy? Why is he controlling his children? And I would never let my children behave like that. <laughs> and all that kind of stuff, right? So somebody wants to try Vox and they say to him, it looks like you're having a really hard time and the kids are being challenging. And he just looks up and says, yeah, my wife died three days ago. And I just don't know what to do. How about instant paradigm shift for everybody in that waiting room? From I don't like you and you're a jerk and I'm gonna judge you to instantly, how can I help you? Mm -hmm. That's paradigm shifting. Now it doesn't always happen that dramatically, but I guarantee you, ain't nobody getting through this life without pain. Now, some of us unfortunately have way more than others and that, you know, I can't, I'm not, I'm not gonna opine on that. But ain't nobody getting through this life without a bunch of pain. And if you had the time and the energy and inclination to actually find out whatever burdens that person was carrying, your paradigm would shift. It just would. What a powerful, powerful story and reminder, Hesha, that when we encounter people who are difficult, we don't know what pain they're bringing to that interaction. So I wanna make sure I'm understanding this understand part clearly because I also see a question in the chat asking for more clarification. So understand, we wanna ask questions so that we can see the other person's world better. Um, and Rosa was asking, you know, in that stage of understanding, you're saying, no, don't make any statements. So could you clarify a bit more why you don't make any statements at that understand part of Vux? So think of it this way. If I'm trying to explain something to you and you make statements to me, do I feel heard? I don't. Uh, you're almost arguing with me. 
Now, if you make a statement that says, you're right, yay, that's great. Okay, that's validating, but it's not really understanding. It's not really understanding my perspective, why I think the way I think and why that is important to me for how I think. And when you make statements, it's almost like a, like a barrier, like a, like a hard line in the sand. Uh, questions are opening and you can understand more. And so if you make statements in the beginning, you may think you understand. But if you ask a bunch more questions afterwards, you're going to have your own epiphany moment of, oh, now I see where you're going. Now I see why that's important. I still don't agree, but at least I understand where you're coming from. It's the human to human connection. I hope that's helpful. It is. It's helpful. So you mentioned, um, Hesha, that your book has 20 tools. So if we get into a difficult conflict situation at work or at home, how do we know which of those 20 tools to tap into? Excellent question as well. So as I said, I'm not kumbaya. I don't, I, I'm sure that there are marvelous things out there that you can take a program, you can get a PhD, you can get a certificate, you can get a master class. I mean, there's lots of stuff out there, but then you have to really be dedicated and have to do it. What about the rest of us? They're just normal human beings. I want something now. I want something easy. I want, how do I handle something right now? I don't have time to take a class. I don't have time to read your big fat book. You know, I mean, it's like, what do I do right now? So the reason I did 20 is because everybody is different. Everybody's going to have a different need for what they have. And each different thing is in a different situation. So my suggestion is you read the book and then you pick your top two. What are the two that are most interesting? And you practice those. And then after a couple of weeks, you go, okay, then take another one, then take another one. And before you know it, you'll have all of them. And then you try different ones in different situations because you, you don't know. Like I'm an, I'm an expert in this. This is my laboratory in the world I live in. So I'll pick a tool. And if I don't get a result, I'll pick another tool. That's the, you can't be wrong. That's the beauty of this. You can't be wrong choose something else. And it's the small winnable victories concept that you want to just get better. And I, actually, I mediated a case years ago. I haven't thought of this in years, years ago with a manufacturer who said to me, best is the enemy of better. I went, what? Why do you talk? What? And best is the enemy of better. And I have to tell you, I didn't understand at the time. I think I was 35 or something, when I told me that over the decades, I see the wisdom and the value in that. When you try to get best, you often can't achieve anything. If you try to get better, you can actually achieve things and make things happen. So I'm not saying don't have big, huge goals and try to change the law. And if you want to do all that, that is marvelous. And get better, a little bit better. And so it's that same thing with these tools is I made them easy and accessible and understandable. And I'll tell you this too, is I have, you know, I tell a lot of stories. And the reason I do that is because human beings are visual creatures. Even if we're visual, auditory, or kinesthetic, the majority of us are visually oriented. And also why all religions teach in, um, in allegories and in analogies. And we have icons on our computers. You know, and the reason we do that is because that's how the brain actually holds and absorbs information. So when I wanna convey something, and if I just speak it, I'm talking to where? Prefrontal cortex. I may wanna to talk to amygdala. Amygdala speaks in pictures. So I will tell a story. And before we're done today, I'm gonna to give you a couple of more, just so you have some. But in each chapter, I have at least three or four stories that are battle tested. <laughs> I've used them multiple times and they work. I give them to you, take them, use them. Because then you don't have to make up your own stories and just say, look, I know this thing works. So in this situation, if I say the story, then I'm not necessarily going, you're wrong. Let me tell you. And you know what? Let me school you. Let me tell you how wrong you are. Yeah. How effective is that? And think about it. That's what we all do. That's the nature of what, how we argue and we debate and we challenge each other with like, you're stupid. Let me school you. And let me teach you how it's really done. Yeah. Let me know how that's working out for you. <laughs> so uh, Jeff has this question that uh, 
applies directly to the idea of the 20 tools in the book. And he's wondering, do you use those tools independently or in tandem depending on the situation? Again, terrific situation, terrific question. Uh, depends on the situation. I mean, it literally depends. And what I would tell you to do is experiment, play around with them. A lot of them will dovetail in with each other where you're starting one, but then there's another one because of how it interacts with each other. So again, I'm gonna give you another analogy and I have a whole chapter in there with this blood type analogy. So in, uh, and I make myself little notes here. So in 1795, Dr. Philip Physic did the very first human blood transplant. This guy lived, this guy died. Yeah, oh well, that's literally what it was. It wasn't until 1901, think about that, 100 years later, 106 years later, that Austrian biologist Karl Landsteiner discovered blood types and that there are eight blood types. And I could kill you if I gave you the wrong blood type and I could make you live if I gave you the right. And there's some like, oh, they're universal that I can flip around with everybody. How absolutely incredible is that, right? And in 1935, African-American surgeon, Dr. Charles Drew actually created blood banks so we could save it and we can use it for people. Why do I like that analogy? There's eight different blood types. So imagine there's eight, 10 archetypes for human beings. And I kind of really think that having dealt with tens of thousands of human beings in conflict situations, I really think that there's like 10 plot lines in the whole world and they just kind of mix and match after that. Just imagine when you go to the zoo and you see a strange animal that has like the beak of this one and the tail of that one and the plumage of that one. I think we're all kind of mix and match. Once you play with this idea, it becomes more familiar to you. Then you use this tool and you know what? I'm gonna throw that one in too, why not? And this one is really more so that I understand the situation. So for example, I gave you Vux. Vux is terrific in a volatile situation, but that dovetails with small winnable victories which we've also talked about, right? So that's my long answer to a short question. <laughs> well, to follow up on that question, there was another request that you could share and you did just share one of the stories, but uh, Danny was wondering if you could share a story and a tool needed for the story. Okay, so uh, let me give you one of my favorite ones. So there was a company that um, sold very expensive couches, like $20,000 couches. You could make them bespoke, totally customized, the material, the fabric, the arm, the size, I mean, everything that you wanted. And people would go online and they would design these very expensive couches. And at the moment of clicking with putting in your credit card, they wouldn't complete the sale or a huge percentage of them wouldn't. And the company couldn't figure out what's going on. So they just kept throwing more money into it and more marketing and more resources. It didn't change the closure rate. So finally they hired a consultant who came in and said, let me Vox, let me ask some questions here to find out what is going on. And they started interviewing people that had signed up by actually calling them and saying, what happened at the point of sale? Why didn't they do it? And you know what the overwhelming answer was? for people who could afford $20,000 couches, they didn't know what to do with their old couch. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Easy solution. When you buy a new couch from us, we will take your old one away. Mattress stores have figured that one out, right? So uh, that is so beautiful because what happens is we tend to go into a problem or a conflict and go, solution. I uh, don't do that. A lot of diagnos diagnosis needs to happen first. What is happening? What is wrong? What is the problem? You don't go to a doctor and say, oh, you know, my stomach hurts me. And he goes, well, you know, these pink pills work for the patient right before you. I'll give you some of them. <laughs> oh, no, you know, there's eight blood types. You want to understand, you want to figure out what's going on in front of you and then say, okay, I'm solving the right problem. That's why I love that couch story. And if we have another moment, can I give you one more story? Just because you know I like, you know, I love all these analogies. I love the stories. Let's hear one. All right. So this is a true story from President Teddy Roosevelt's presidential campaign. When he ran on a third party ticket, he was already president and he didn't get the Republican nomination for a whole lot of interesting political reasons. So he ran by himself. So the, the on a third party ticket and the campaign was a little short on cash. Campaign manager had to go do something. So he left and he put a staffer in charge and said, I need uh, a million brochures. I want you to get them ready. 
So the guy created a million brochures and then he thought, I'm going to make them happy. And he went ahead and printed them. Campaign manager came back and looked at the picture on the cover, which is a picture of Teddy Roosevelt and said, where's the license from the photographer to use this photograph? Oh God, I didn't know how to do that. Oh God, oh God, oh God. They said, if the guy sues us for even a penny, an image, it'll bankrupt our campaign. I, what are we gonna do about this? Thought about it, thought about it. Holding the calm is creative. So you know what he did? He sent a telegram to the um, photographer and said, uh, I'm considering, and, and we'll be printing a million brochures for President Roosevelt's reelection campaign. Um, I'm considering different photographers for the cover photo. How much will you pay us to use your photograph? Came back to the reply, the most I can offer is $250. Done. <laughs> Save the campaign. Now, and I have that story in the book with a caveat. If it's a one-off situation and you need to stop a war, remember, holding the calm is not kumbaya. It's real. What do you need to do to stop a war? If it's a long-term relationship issue, you wouldn't have used that tool, right? Because relationships and trust and make sure we can trust each other and all that kind of stuff would be, would be of a higher value than a one-off situation. So it's so blood type dependent. What do you have in front of you? What's the nature of the relationship? What are you doing? What happens? I got a bag of tricks. What do I choose to use? Well, and I'm, I'm really curious and interested about what I'm seeing in the chat because people were asking for some clarification back to Vux and asking for what the C stands for, um, which is clarify, right? But people are saying it could be curious too. So how did I that land with you? People are hey, rewriting your, you. your model. Thank you, everybody who gave curious to the, to the world and the group. I actually think I like it better than clarify. Excellent. Well done. All right, so we've had so many questions coming in and I'm gonna to shift to taking some of these questions if it's okay with you, Hesha, and we'll sure. get to as many as we can, but I, I see that Wendy is also letting people know how to stay um, in touch. Um, I've had a couple of people uh, ask the question, how do you listen to what is not being said? So when you're in these high conflict situations, what are the skills that we can apply to be able to hear or see things that people aren't saying to us? Yeah, see, that is absolutely marvelous. I love that question. That one takes a little more skill and practice. Um, so this is the deal. People will say things they don't mean all the time. People will demand things they don't want. People stay in relationships that don't serve them. People wear clothes that are uncomfortable. People have jobs that they hate. The human nature is such that we do things that we don't want or like or serve us. That's just part of human nature of what happens. So just because someone tells you something, you're listening, you're hearing that, but you're also hearing below it. Does it feel accurate with what you're seeing? Does it uh, comport, for those of you who can read body language, does it comport with body language? Does it comport with what I know of this person. And if I'm confused or I don't know, what am I going to do? Box. I'm going to ask. I'm going to be curious. I'm going to try to ask and understand a little bit more. And so it's going beneath. So someone may say, for example, I mean, this is you know, for those of, those of you that are mediators and we do business mediation, and you are all going to laugh when I say this. When somebody says to me, it's a matter of principle. When I was younger, I used to think, oh, it's a matter of principle. No, it's not. No, it's a matter of money. That's what that means. It's a matter of money. But you have to give someone the face saving of taking the higher ground that it's a matter of principle. But in the end, it's a matter of money. So all of my mediator lawyer folks on this webinar are laughing right now. Um, so I'm not telling you to not listen to what people say, because remember why I started with that quote from F. Scott Fitzgerald? The test of a first rate intelligence is to hold two conflicting views in your mind at the same time. I hear you. And in my own mind, I'm wondering how accurate that really is for what you really want. So I'm going to be curious. I'm going to watch. I'm going to ask. I'm going to see. And I'm not going to uh, insist on this solution or push that agenda. I'm going to be light and open and allow it to just form the way it's going to form. Then everyone's a lot happier in the end if you do that as well. And I explain this a lot more in some of the chapters in the book. I know, Hesha, that you said that there are a bunch of these fail 
safe statements that we can write down and use in high conflict situations. And as you were talking about this, I thought this would be a really great time for you to tell us some of those fail safe statements. So people, if you have a pen handy, I would encourage you to write these down. Uh, let's see. Well, I didn't know we were going to go over that one, so I don't have them at the top of my head. I just kind of make them up as I go along. And uh -huh. I've got, I have them sprinkled throughout the book. But let me just, they're general things that come again with that curiosity word, which I absolutely love. So uh, I have a list if you want me to help you. Oh, did thank you very much. You, we sure. pulled them out of the book for me. Yeah. <laughs> what, so what, I mean, uh, what did I say? <laughs> uh, that seems really important to you. You got it. You seem very passionate about that. There you go. You seem very concerned about that. Very good. I want to learn more about that. There you go. That's interesting. Do you think I might have a different opinion? Isn't that a good one? That is a really good one. And I tell you what, you know what we're going to call that one? That's the Thanksgiving dinner one. <laughs> when you have a relative who says, God knows what, well, that's interesting. Do you think I might have a different opinion about that? It either shuts the conversation down, which may be what you want, or opens one up, which may be what you want. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, um, so many comments and Wendy did put all of those fail safe statements in the chat, but Bob added one, what would it, what will it look like? Uh, I like that one too. You could do that one too. The beauty of this is you, there, this is not like a recipe. This is, if I take flour, eggs, you know, and milk, I can make any flavor cake I want. That's really the beauty of what this is. And what I tried to do in this book is to give you the DNA, tools, anecdotes, stories so that you go bake your cakes go go out there and do this wonderful amazing stuff in the world you know and within your sphere of influence make your sphere of influence better yes so question from cynthia how will knowing and understanding our triggers help us hold the calm and what's your idea on the role of triggers uh see that's a very good question too that's an amygdala question so you, it would be wise for you to know your own triggers, like to know, you know, what bothers you. Like, and I'll tell you for me, when someone gives me attitude, mm -mm, I do not like attitude. It aggravates me. And what's the trick? I'm holding the calm. I'm holding the calm. I'm holding the calm because I don't know what's going on for that person. Are they like the guy in the waiting room? His wife just died. Are they in a terrible marriage? Did they just lose their job? Did they just get a, her a terrible you know, health report? Did they, were they just raised by an alcoholic, abusive step-parent? I mean, like what? You, know, you don't really know and you can't really get into it. So I'm holding the calm, I'm holding the calm because I'm feeling triggered. So I'm not going to act when I'm triggered. I'm gonna have the emotional maturity to just say I'm triggered, it's even to myself. I don't have to be vulnerable and tell you. Now, if you're in a relationship with, you know, where it's a relationship with people, it's very healthy to say, I'm triggered right now. I can't really talk to you for a minute. I need to, you know, hold the calm. I need to, I need to take a pause. That's extremely healthy. And it, it, it allows the other person to do it too. And I'll tell you another thing that's really wonderful. And it usually works better in relationships where you have a relationship with somebody. Let's say someone, they're having a ticky day or whatever, and they say something snarky to you. You can go, hmm, you want to try that again? How about we do a do-over on that one? Then the other person can go, huh, what, huh, huh? And I go, did you intend for that to sound the way it sounded? I mean, did you intend to offend me? Really? Completely changes the conversation rather than you offended me and you're wrong and, rah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. I love that. I think we need to put that on the list of those fail safe uh, comments. <laughs> Can we have a do over? Um, so, a do over what is so good, by the way, too, is it's so nice because if you give do overs, then guess what? You get do overs. <laughs> and none of us is perfect. We all have cranky days, right? So, I like living in a little bit of grace. I like having the ability to have a do-over. So put some do-over credit in the bank with the people in your family, because then they will give that do-over credit back to you when you need it. <laughs> well, and I suppose we could always ask for it. When we say things that we wish we hadn't said, we could you know, catch ourselves and say, could I have a do-over? That didn't come out the way I wanted it to. Indeed, indeed. 
So one of your chapters is about politeness and civility and how those matter. Why is that? And what does that mean? Isn't that just marvelous? It was so heartening to me as I was, you know, writing the book, I was trying to figure out, I knew that sort of intuitively, how did I write that? And I found a study uh, that was done in England where they wanted to actually do a scientific study. How does politeness, does it, does it really matter? Or is it just like, yeah, 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 you're just being polite. But did it really matter? So they had a long line of people in front of a, a copier machine. They set up a copier machine that could make free copies. And then so they got a long line of people and they would have people cut the line and they would cut the line with different excuses. Big, long involved ones. Oh my God, you know, my kid is sick and I have to do something and I'm late for, you know, some big thing got like 90% compliance. Sure, go in front of me, right? Uh, then they tried making it shorter. Uh, I'm really in a hurry. I need to cut the line. Got like a 70%. Please, I need to cut the line. No reason, no justification, no excuse. Still got like a 70% compliance rate. Just being polite. And the beauty about being polite is that one, it's civilized. You can be civilized. I love the expression, you know, throw kindness around like confetti because you don't know what is going on for other people in their lives that day. And if you're having a good day, spread it around. Why not? And then maybe that's a carbon offset that you'll get it spread around to you when you're having a cranky day also. But just the simple treating people with decency and respect, it is amazing. It opens up doors. And you know what it opens up doors with? The most difficult people the most challenging people, the people that you think are narcissists or a sociopath, and you give them like big old labels. It's amazing what it does for that. Amazing. And there's actually a scientific study that I go through in that chapter to prove it to those of us that are left brain oriented that say, prove it to me. You know, so uh, uh, I like it. My husband's from, from Missouri and I joke that he's from Missouri, the show me state. <laughs> Love it. Well, I want to highlight something that Diane shared in the chat. Um, she will often, instead of the do over, use the language upgrade and offer an upgrade, you know, say, uh, can I, can I upgrade that language? So an upgrade acknowledges that we all have old operating systems that need regular updating to be more inclusive, kind, and compassionate. So we can catch ourselves if we've said something and in, in not the best way. And I, I wanted to be sure to highlight that. I also, I'm seeing a ton of people talking about pre-ordering the book. So thank you to all of you. And even Karen, happy birthday on July 24th, my oldest kid, that's their birthday too. Um, and Karen is pre-ordering the book now on her Amazon wish list as a birthday. Um, I'm also wanting to highlight um, people you. who are just talking about how much they love your warmth uh, oh, and the you. approach that you take to this. Oh, in improv, they use the term new choice. <laughs> so that seems like it, that seems like another, Good. another tool. Well, we are we are coming to the end of the hour, but I'm going to give people a chance. If you had a question that I didn't get to that you want to bump back up into the chat again, I've been doing my best to curate all the questions and bring the most important ones to light. Uh, no judgment calls on the most important, but the ones that I see to light. Um, and so if you had a question that we didn't get to, I think we have time potentially to take one more. Um, and if you want to go ahead and bump that up for me in the chat. And while you look for your questions, um, there is one from Angie and she's wondering, can you tell us a little more how to deal with someone who refuses to talk during conflict and just shuts down? And it looks like Angie wanted uh, to bring that, that back too. Good. Very, very good. So remember we talked about amygdala, fight, flight, or freeze, right? So they could either be freezing or they don't feel safe or they don't have the skill set to know how to handle that. So you would use Vox. You would say, you seem uh, pretty concerned that this be handled correctly. You seem, uh, um, uh, well, you seem, I would use the word concerned, but sometimes people don't like that verb. So you can say something like, um, is this bothering you? Do you think there's another way we could handle it? What do you think would be most effective? I have another chapter in the book called A Dozen Roses. When you ask someone for advice, it's as if you gave them a dozen roses. People love to give their advice and then be listened to on top of it. That just made it two dozen roses. So when someone won't talk, that's because they are being spoken to. They are, may have statements being made on them. They feel powerless, so they withdraw. If you're not gonna to listen to anything I have to say, why should I talk? 
If you're not going to do what I want anyway, why should I help? That's an, it's a natural reaction to the stimuli that is coming. So remove the stimuli and start asking questions. I love it. And I do see some comments that people are wanting a recording. We will have a recording. Um, one more thing. So can you, um, oh man, I lost it. Oh, any advice on conflict over Zoom compared to in-person? Does this, yeah. does it's, Vox work exactly, on Zoom too? Yeah, exactly the same. I mean, it, it's all exactly the same, legitimately. And the thing is social media and Zoom, I mean, there's a screen in front of you, right? So it's not quite as intimate as it can be in real life. On the other hand, it's also a little safer right? If, if I'm having to feel vulnerable or there's a little antagonism or things are a little more intense, I got a screen in front of me. So there's some kind of a level of safety. So this kind of vux and asking these questions is so valuable to do that. What would be a more effective way to handle this? What would be, what, what is your opinion? And then you add a dozen roses to it on top of it. I mean, let's say somebody feels powerless and you say to them, I, I want to know your opinion on it. That matters. Bada boom, bada bang. How fantastic is that? Yeah, that is amazing. Well, as we wrap up the hour, I want to make sure that people know how to stay in touch with you and learn from you, Hesha. And then we are going to give you a chance to share some closing comments. So as many of you have already done, you can pre-order Holding the Comma on Amazon or any of your favorite online retailers today. And for those of you who may be in an organization and you think this book could be very powerful in your organization or potentially in a book group, group or a book club or some other kind of learning environment, we would encourage you to go to porchlightbooks.com to be able to find the best bulk discounts. And you can learn more from Hesha by visiting her website at holdthecalm.com. And we would love, love, love uh, for you to share about Hesha and her book on social media. Um, you know, as the book comes out next month, the best way that you can help others and create a more civilized society is for people to have access to these ideas. So we encourage you to share these ideas with others. And uh, Hesha, I'm going to go back to you to and give us some parting thoughts. One thing, I think we made a mistake and Nancy, my chief of staff, would you put it in the chat? I think our webpage is holdingthecom.com. I think. So I want to make sure we did that right because it might, it's not hold the calm. I'm pretty sure it's uh, hold the calm.com. So that catch. would be the website and then it'll have, but the beautiful thing is we say I'm holding the calm. I hold the calm. It's all similar, but it's holding because it's more active is why we came up with that title. Um, we do have that in the chat. Website. Perfect. So you have that. Um, and so uh, look, this is the thing that I'd really want to tell people. There's two things. I wrote a discussion guide in the back of the book. And the reason for that is that in organizations that you need professional education credit, you can take the table of contents and that discussion guide, turn it into your state authority, and you'll get continuing legal education, continuing medical education, whatever your continuing education credits are, you can get by doing that. Plus creating a little group cements the learning. Uh, and yes, I think it's gonna be available in the audio format. I just saw a chat come up from that. Um, uh, there's a beautiful woman that recorded it for me and her voice is melodic and lovely. You'll like it. Uh, anyway, so back to the discussion guide. So if you think this is helpful within organizations, first of all, there's, you know, cheap, cheap, cheap volume discounts through porch light. So it makes it really effective. And if everybody is getting the book and reading it and talking about it, now you've got a little lexicon within the company. Can I have a do over? Um, you know, I'm holding the calm or let's hold the calm when the situation gets tense. And all of a sudden it becomes a way that's easy for people to talk about it. That's why I did it that way. I wanted to make it accessible and make it easy. And so my last parting thought to everybody is unfortunately sometime this week, someone's going to do something to annoy you. <laughs> it's just, I'm telling you, it's going to happen. They're going to aggravate and annoy you. And there's going to be something that's going to come up. So it's the spaghetti sauce. Remember? try to wipe it up early when it's easy. And let's say it's intense. Your partner does something that, God, they do it every time. Er, er, er. Your kid or your coworker or a politician or anything. I'm holding the calm. I'm holding the calm. And I usually close my eyes when I do it. I don't know why. I'm holding the calm. I'm holding the calm. I'm holding the calm. Let that create a moat between what you feel and what you choose to do. And let's make our world less acrimonious and more harmonious. We can do it. We can. Yay.
<laughs> Thank you all for spending an hour of your life with me. I'm very so grateful. <laughs>